Welcome back, folks. You're watching WatchGuard Security Week in Review, a video podcast dedicated to quickly summarizing the biggest information and network security stories each week and to sharing some practical security advice along the way. I'm Corey Nockreiner, your host and all-around security professional, and this is the episode for the week starting January 13th, 2014. The second Tuesday of the month fell on this week, so I have to talk about Patch Day. Now at this point, I've already written about all the patches, so I don't really look forward to talking about them, but patch time is really the most important time for network administrators. You can avoid most of the attacks on the internet by keeping your software up to date. So let's jump right into Patch Day. Well, this week we had a trifecta of corporations patching their products. Not only was it Microsoft Patch Day, but Adobe shares the same Patch Day, and this this month, Oracle's uh, quarterly patch day happened to fall on the same day as Adobe and Microsoft's day. Microsoft released four bulletins. They fixed problems in Windows, Office, and a product called Dynamics AX. The Windows updates were probably the most important since one fixed a zero-day vulnerability affecting Windows XP. So be sure to upgrade your Windows computers as soon as possible. On top of that, it's important to note that Microsoft is going to end of support Windows XP sometime in April. So if you haven't considered transitioning to other Windows operating systems, you should probably consider doing so now. We also had Adobe Patch Day. Adobe released updates for Reader, Acrobat, and their Flash Player. Pretty much these fixed memory corruption flaws, very similar to the Reader and Flash flaws we see every month, but these are serious flaws. Basically, if an attacker can get you to a malicious website or can get you to open a Reader document that's been malformed in some way, you can exploit these flaws to gain your privileges on your computer. Finally, it was Oracle's critical patch update, their quarterly big patch day. And they released 144 uh, fixes for vulnerabilities that spanned many of their products, their, their SQL Server product, MySQL, their Sun products, and Java. Most people use Java. It's very risky right now. So make sure to get Oracle's Java patch. In any case, if you use any of Oracle's wide range of products, be sure to check out their bulletin for more details on all the patches. In social network hijacking news, we learned the Syrian Electronic Army hijacked some more accounts. Basically, they hijacked the Xbox uh, Microsoft support account and the Microsoft official blog. Now, this is pretty typical for the Syrian Electronic Army. They find big Twitter accounts, try to get the password, and then take them over for a little bit. Typically, the way they do this is very basic phishing attacks. Uh, I say basic, but maybe they use smarter email lures, they more better written emails and stuff like that, but really it comes down down to many, many phishing emails that some poor user at Microsoft fell for, and he inputted the password and thus giving it to the Syrian Electronic Army. Now, in ironic news, later in the week, the Syrian Electronic Army's own website was also pwned by another hacking group. A Turkish hacking group claimed responsibility and attacked the Syrian Electronic Army's website because of all their, their phishing emails targeted towards Turkish companies as well. So the takeaway here is be very careful for phishing emails. If you ever get emails, asking to enter your credentials, you shouldn't do it via the links in the emails. If for any reason you want to check something out that an email says, manually go to the site in question and enter your credentials there after making sure that you have a true SSL connection to the real domain you're going to. Another big story from the week comes from a local security research group and company here in Seattle called IOActive. One of their researchers released a blog post talking about the insecure state of many of the banking, the online banking applications that we use on our mobile phones and tablets. Without going into all the details, this particular researcher took around 60 different mobile banking apps from very, very popular banks and tried to do some black box security analysis of them. Now, all his testing was on the local mobile device itself. He wasn't testing network security or how these actually connected to the, the back-end bank servers, but rather he was checking their local security. And he found a lot of problems. For instance, he found 40% of the 60 applications didn't actually validate the SSL certificates properly, which could allow attackers to create man-in-the-middle attacks for your banking traffic. He also learned that about 90% of the, the 60 applications used non 
non-SSL pages as well. This makes it easier for hackers to maybe inject something. If they can gain a man-in-the-middle attack on your device, they might be able to inject some more JavaScript to get you to enter some other credentials. And because this was injected in a non-SSL page, you won't get any sort of warnings telling you it's an injection. So the researcher found a ton of other interesting vulnerabilities, including the fact that these apps didn't use some memory protection mechanisms and mobile OSs and other things like that. Now the good news is most of the vulnerabilities the researcher found were kind of local in nature. Either the attacker would need some sort of local privilege on your computer to run malicious code, or he would need some sort of access to your local network, or at least your path on the internet, so that he could do a man-in-the-middle attack. In any case, any sort of security flaws in such a sensitive application are a pretty big deal. So hopefully we'll see these banks release updates to their banking apps soon. In other really quick mobile security related news, we also learned of a new vulnerability affecting the Starbucks mobile application. Now before I jump into the vulnerability, I also learned that apparently the Starbucks application is the most popular mobile payment application that's used in the United States. You know, in Europe and Japan, they often use mobile phones to make payments using a, a different type of technology. But in the US, it's actually the Starbucks app that's used more than anything else for mobile payments. So it turns out a researcher discovered that the Starbucks application stores passwords in a clear text on your mobile phone. Now this vulnerability still requires an attacker gain local access to your phone or actual physical access of it. But if he can hook it up to a computer, he can quickly find your Starbucks app password. So hopefully Starbucks will fix this soon. Quickly want to share a security story for any of you iPhone jailbreakers out there. Uh, this week a researcher on Twitter posted a, a, a tweet talking about how there was a backdoor in the recent evasion jailbreak. If you jailbreak your phone, you probably know that they recently released an untethered jailbreak for iOS 7. Now I actually sometimes jailbreak for research and security reasons, but for normal people jailbreaking is very, very unsafe because it can open the phone to new vectors which attackers can attack, including a, a default password that sometimes used in jailbreak. In any case, a researcher that goes by the alias WinOCM released some details showing there's actually a vulnerability in the evasion jailbreak itself. I won't go into all the technical details, but he actually released a very technical post showing some assembly language and a one-line command he can use to actually execute any code he wants to on your jailbroken phone. Now there is good news. Since his original post, uh, the city of folks have actually released an update to the evasion jailbreak that supposedly fixes this particular system call issue. So if you go update your city or repositories, you should be fine. In any case, it does highlight that there is a dangerous nature to jailbreaking. While it can be useful for security professionals to help them uh, do black box testing of their phone and to figure out flaws in mobile apps, in fact, I bet you the person that found all the banking flaws used a jailbroken phone to help him find those. It can also be very dangerous. It actually means means there's some unsanctioned code running on your phone and they're using holes in the phone's security to get that to work. So that means attackers might be able to exploit those holes as well. Long story short, if you're a normal consumer or business user, you should not root or jailbreak your mobile devices. So let's end with the biggest story of the week, which is going to be a recap of the target breach I mentioned a few weeks ago. This week, there were quite a few different updates about that target breach we talked about earlier, which is turning out to be one of the biggest cyber breaches we've seen in a long time. Now, I'll write a blog post about this, which I'll release next week, but let me quickly share some of the updates. First, Target CEO did an interview early in the week, and one of the biggest disclosures there was, while he didn't admit how the malware got into their network, he did confirm that the breach was due to malware on point-of-sale register systems, so point-of-sale malware. He also shared a lot of important updates for consumers, including the fact that you will not be liable to any losses. He also shared that you can get free credit monitoring for a year. All you have to do is go to Target site to figure out how. Another related update is another retailer, Neiman Marcus, 
also reported that during around the same time, they suffered a very similar breach and have lost some credit card information for their customers. Now at this point, other than the similar time frame, it's, it's unclear whether or not this is the same attackers or different attackers. And besides Neiman Marcus, Brian Krebs, who is the security blogger and independent journalist who's actually uncovering a lot of these updates, has said there's three unnamed smaller retailers that may have to do with some malls that have also had breaches on top of it. However, one of the biggest things that Krebs thinks he uncovered is specifically what malware was used in this point of sale system attack. Specifically, he's tied it to a piece of malware called Black POS. Now, if you followed this, this security uh, video, you know that back in March of last year, I actually released some details of Bla Black POS. It was discovered by a security research organization called Group IB uh, last year, early last year. And it was malware that specifically seemed to target point of sale systems because it looked for track one and track two data. In any case, it seems very likely that the malware used in the target breach is related to Black POS. So it's a very interesting blog post. I'll be sure to put a link to it in the, the blog associated with this video. Now also know another security group that claims to be working with the US authorities to track down these target hackers says that while this malware is related or derivative of Black POS, it is not an exact duplicate of Black POS as, as Krebs might have suggested. Anyways, these are all interesting updates and it's very, very clear that this is point of sale system malware. So the major takeaway you can, you can learn from right now, especially if you're a retail organization, is bad guys are really heavily targeting point of sale systems. So we need to make sure to have some protections around them. One protection is being sure to segment them from other computers on our internal network. We tend to use firewalls and security appliances to segment the external world from our internal network, but there's different trust relations on our internal network as well. Well, your normal users that are browsing the web should never be on the same network as something as important as a point of sale system. They should be segmented. So that's one tip you might take away if you're a retailer. Well, that's all for this week. I hope you found it educational and at least a little entertaining. And be sure to follow us next week as well. As always, if you want more details on these stories, I'll be sure to post links to references about them in the uh, blog post associated with this video, which you can always find on our WatchGuard Security Center blog. And be sure to follow that blog as I post other security stories there as well. As always, you can also follow me on Twitter. I'm at SecAdept or follow WatchGuard at WatchGuardTech. Thank you for watching, and here at WatchGuard, we're rooting for you.